Okay, it's being recorded. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your night to go over the damage assessment. Um, what we're going to do, hopefully, tonight is give you some intricacies of what being a damage assessor is, how to do it, and make a lot of money doing. This is not a glory job. It's not for fame. It's for helping people, pure and simple. I have been out, as Mike said, in the field. I have done damage assessment, so this is not new to me. And we want to make sure that you guys totally understand how to, how to go through and do the damage assessing. So let me ask, has anyone done damage assessing before? If anyone has, just say yes. 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 Okay, perfect. All right. So <clears throat> you guys will, will be able to keep me honest and straight as we go through this. All right. So Mike did the introduction. We're going to start with the power and electric system. There are three main parts of the electric system, generation, transmission, and the one we're concerned with is distribution. That's the, that's the system that supplies all the power to the homes, whether it's 120 volts, 240 volts, all the way up to 600 volts. That's what we're concerned with. We don't really do the generation because that's physically at the power plant. The transmission or all the high tension lines um, that come out of the power plant to the um, locations that step down all of the power. And again, we don't normally get involved with that. It's just distribution. So that's what we're going to concentrate all of the time on. All right. So you probably have all seen this diagram or something very similar to it. It was in the last presentation that Troy had put in. But we're going to go a little bit deeper, other than just looking at wires, transformers, secondary wires, and additional components. But only those four things are on a physical pole. So not a lot looking at that say, well, that seems really easy. It gets a little bit more complicated. And we're going to show you what that is. The very first thing. Anytime you get called out to do damage assessment, you always have to make sure that if you have a pole that's down, cracked, or whatever, you always have to make sure that you give them the correct information for the class of the pole and the length. So if you see where that little red arrow is, uh, this one is a 4-40. So it's a class four and the 40 is the physical length of the pole. Now, if the pole is cracked or it's down and you can't see it, we don't want you traipsing through tons of wires that could be potentially a real shocking experience for you. Go to the next pole that's up. Chances are they're the exact same pole. So you can always pull it off of that. Okay, so that's the first criteria that we have to take care of. You've seen, again, this diagram. This is pretty much everything that you will find on electric pole. You will not find everything on every single pole. But just like Troy told you um, the last time we did this, keep that little diagram with you. This is also a good diagram to keep with you because you're going to have to tell the people in the when you're doing the damage assessment what exactly is down. Is the transformer down, guy wire down, whatever. And it gives you a good idea of where all these things are. But you know, what you're looking at is the perfect world, and we are not going into the perfect world. <clears throat> This is the consumer equipment. 
every house has a weather head, which is where the power lines come in from the power company to the physical location. The service mass is just simply a tube that the wires run down to the meter enclosure. And the weather head, the service mass, and the meter enclosure, all three of those are the consumer's responsibility. They have to put them up. When I say they have to put them up, if something happens, service cannot be restored to this location until the service mast, weatherhead, and meter enclosure is back attached to the building. The power company does not do that. The people that do it would have to have an electrical contractor physically mount this for them. And if this is not mounted on the house and the power company comes to restore the service, they're going to um, deny the people to get their service connected because this has not been corrected. And the reason we, we tell you this is because when you're out in the field, you're going to have all the vests on and you're going to have all the qualifications, the information saying that you're a damage assessor and people are going to look at you and the first thing they're going to say, when's up, when's up, how are going to be on? And easy answer is you don't know when the power will be on, but we're doing the best to get you to turn back on as soon as possible. And that's the reason we're here. Then you start asking the questions or you, or you physically look yourself. Is the service mast and weatherhead okay? If it is, perfect, then we don't have to worry about anything else. The other thing you always want to check is to see if a generator is running. Because if a generator is running and the people that are running that generator have not gone to their electrical panel inside the house and thrown the main breaker, if the power comes back on, you're gonna have the generator supplying power, you're gonna have power coming in from the electric company and two sources of power coming in is not going to be very beneficial to that homeowner. So you always wanna to check to make sure to see if there is a generator running. If, it, if there is, make sure you tell them that they need to make sure that, that their main breaker is powered off. Okay, any questions so far? All right. This is an example of the mass being down. And as you can see, all the lines are down coming in. So this would ha have to be installed by the electrical contractor before the service is installed by the power company. Now, what you saw before with the little diagrams of the pole, that was the perfect world. This is what you're physically going to see. Gets a little bit more complicated because the poles aren't standing up straight and you have to look and see what's going on. This is an actual picture of some damage that had occurred. So as you look at that, what could you possibly tell me about this picture? What would need to be repaired? Anybody? Pole, pole transformer, and probably guide wire at least. Okay. But the truth, we probably, all of, uh, the, the transformer and wire is probably probably still good because it's still connected in the, they probably just really tran just transfer it from that pole top to another pole. Just um, just by looking, there ain't no oil. That transformer ain't got no oil on the ground. So it's not spilling the transformer, it's still working. It's just been, you got to put a fuse cut out because it's going to multiple houses, not not one. Um, it's, a, it's, it's simpler, simpler than it looks. Yep. <clears throat> it is. What what else would you report on this? 
uh, tree on the wire. Correct. So you would need a tree crew to come in before you could repost, repost this pole back in the ground and get the wires back, back together. Yeah. Right. Now, what type of wires are we looking at, folks? Any idea? Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, steel it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a primary uh, uh, you got one primary wire and a uh, neutral yep exactly so can can you guys see my cursor moving on the screen no okay I can barely see all right. So what, oh, what I you I made it bigger. All right. So what you would actually see and mo most Hang on one second. Have... Ron, you have a couple of people in the waiting room. Sorry, I can't bring them back in. Okay, they are admitted. <clears throat> so what would actually be reported here is the transformer, that was a good catch. There is, there is no oil on the ground, so we would not have to get the EPA involved, which is a good thing anytime we do not have to get the EPA involved is, is good. However, if there was an oil leak, we would have to post somebody there to stay with there until somebody could come and take care of that spill. The primary wire is down. That was correct. The neutral is down. And the neutral is the one that's right below the transformer. And that's always going to be the case. And you have to get a, a tree crew. When you do the tree crew, you have to let them know, do they, do they just need somebody with chainsaws that can cut up the tree? Or do they need a bucket truck? In this case, they can probably just get away with chainsaws and then they can move the, the tree out of the road and onto the, the side of the houses. Okay. Next screen just goes, just like we said, those are the individual pieces of what would have to be reported. Okay. <clears throat> now, when you go to report something, I always encourage you to take all the pictures you can possibly take. The damage, that definitely you need to take pictures of the pole, the tree in the road, and the lines down. So minimum of, of three, pic, three pictures. I'm going to also encourage you to take a picture of the street sign and take a picture of the house number. That way, when everything goes in, they know exactly the correct address where this tree is. And if it's a long street, they don't have to go looking for it. All right. <clears throat> what you see here, this was Louisiana from Hurricane Ida on the 29th of August. I took these pictures while I was out there. Just to give you an idea, everything's not rosy. As you can see, the, the lines are all over the streets. Poles are, are bent all the way down, so every single pole that's bent needs to be replaced. Um, transformers are probably in good, good shape. You also look at the cross arms on the physical poles themselves to make sure those are okay. And on this picture with the, with the nearest pole facing us, you see that the, uh, the fuse um, is to be intact, but you would have to be reporting that there's a fuse. And you would be reporting multiple spans down because the spans between the poles, it's not just one pole, it's many poles. And when you do the, say there is a span down, you need to give them a rough idea of the span between the two poles. And that's just simply walking and counting. So if it's 50 feet, you know, that, that's what you put in. 
but it gives them a rough idea of what they're looking at. Another view. <clears throat> this one's a, a little bit more intense because now you're on both sides of the street that have issues. <clears throat> and every single poll that you see here, even the, the, the one closest to the, to the picture, every single poll has to be replaced. So you're looking at a minimum here of seven poles. And it appears that some of them, um, <clears throat> as we get to the, to the far end by the bridge, some of them have some cross members that, that are down and everything else. But you, would, you can see all the primary lines are down. Um, the neutral is down after the third uh, pole. Hello. And, and that's what you would be putting in. Yeah. Okay. You have a question? Yes, I do. And the question is, can can everybody that's not participating mute themselves? Because I think our recording is going to be a little bit um, convoluted. So mute yourself. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Last picture in the series shows you just, you know, with the, with the pole being bent, what what you physically see and so in this case you'll see the the large capacitors um holding the the lines up because they're high voltage lines you know you're going to see different sizes different things the pole right right after that has three transformers so it's not a, a single service it's a multiple service so this is spanning out 240 volts and the way you can always tell that a single transformer is 120 a triple transformer is 240 okay hey ron i don't have control um but i see some people maybe don't know how to mute themselves i believe you can so see if you can mute anybody that's not muted All right, looks like every, uh, Ricardo's still. All right, looks like everybody's muted now. All right, so this is where we go into some of the other things that happen. Again, live picture. So you can see exactly everything that has to be done. So on this one, want you guys to tell me what you would be reporting on. Anybody? Oh, transformer with leakage, from what I can think I see, primary and secondary. Yep. And a tree crew. Uh, yep. Street, got a street light. Correct. Um. Okay, a couple of important things. Since since the transformer is down, and this yeah, oil, you got a lines down. The hazmat. Service. The hazmat. Service yeah. drops down. The, the, yep, the service drop is down. That is correct. The, the, so what you would do is if you come across this situation. You immediately call your team leader. You let them know the street that you're on, the address you're at, which is why you take those two pictures. You take a picture <clears throat> of the transformer and the leakage, and you send it to the team leader. You will remain on site at that location until someone comes and relieves you because we have to have someone from Hazmat come in and secure the area. And we don't want a bunch of people coming in, traipsing around and everything else. Um, we do have line crews that can come in. A lot of times they're not available at the, at the moment because we're out doing all the image assessment. 
So we don't usually have a lot of people um, that we can spare. So you would just have to stay on site until someone comes and takes care of this. Okay, so on this one, you mentioned the service drop is down, which is correct. So you look at you look at the side of the building and make sure that that service mast is okay. If it is, perfect. If you if you're talking to to the customers, um, and they come out and ask you again, when's the power going to come on? You know, use use your just best judgment. You know, we're working on it. That's why we're here to restore the service as quick as possible. If they tell you that they need their electricity turned on because someone is in the house that needs oxygen. Duke Energy normally has a list of all the houses that that happens and they prioritize the repair. So those houses are taken care of first. But if you do run across that, notify your team leader so he can put that into the notes and notify the appropriate people that there is a person in the house that needs their electricity turned on. Sorry again, but you got another party in the waiting room. Um, usually, if uh, you get to the meter base and you look where you send where the head is on the house, um, if, if they own Duke system and their oxygen is out, uh, if they on the oxygen, they have a special tag that they have tagged there. Usually the red means non-payment and like a blue is in service. I think I can't remember exactly what, I don't know the area, so I don't know what color they would use, but they identify it by the color that they put on there to seal their, their meter in. If they own their system and notified with the oxygen tanks. Co correct. But we, we're not always sure of the colors that they put in. So as long as you have a picture of the street sign and the house address, we can send it to them. And then it doesn't really make it any difference at that point in time what color it is. They know that the service needs to be restored to that house as soon as possible. Any questions? And again, these are, these are all the answers. One thing that you have to make sure of is that when you look at this, you see that you do, do not just have one pole that's down, you have a line that spans between two poles. So you need to give them a, an idea of the distance between the two poles. You can see that second pole is leaning so it's important to get the class and the footage of the poll. When you do this, do not walk around the wires. Do not touch a wire. Mo most cases, they're going to be dead. However, if they are not, your proximity alarm will be going off because you wear those on the top of your, your hot hat. And that will tell you if you come within 10 feet of a power line that's active, but still avoid them at all costs. Walk around the house, do whatever you need to do to get the information. You know, if a wire is on the ground and you can step over one wire safely, okay. If there's two wires, don't even attempt it. I mean, safety is number one when you're doing this type of work. We don't want you to be a 911 call because, you know, proximity alarm didn't go off and you touched a wire and then you get zapped. The, the last thing that we ever want to have happen to you guys. So don't touch anything, just walk around it. These are the type of forms that you're going to be filling out. <clears throat> These are the, the damage assessment forms. So this is where you put in the date and time. The district, we may or may not know, but it doesn't make a difference. <clears throat> the polling device, you, you can give them the poll information. 
you put in the address and that along with the pictures will give them the correct address of where we need to go to. And then you start making determination what has to happen. So right underneath where, where you see environmental spill that you would um, check off if we have a transformer that's down and leaking oil. So you would, you would again, tell us, we would make that call and get, get the crew out. And then you start continuing to fill out the information. Does the customer have a trouble? Again, do, does he need oxygen? Whatever the case may be. If the mast is down, do they need an electrician to come and fix it? Does the customer have power? Yes or no. So if they're running a generator, you make sure that you click off. Click off. Yes, they have power. And you put a note right above it, generator. If their service mast is down, damaged, you check off, you've advised the customer that they need to have an electrician or an electrical contractor come out <clears throat> and physically put this, put this mast up before they can get service restored. Most cases, we don't leave a door hanging. Then you go through, okay, what wires are down? If you always start from the top of the pole, your primaries are down. If the pole is completely down, your secondaries are going to be down. Your neutral is going to be down. What else is a problem? Is there cable? Is the cable TV or telephone lines down? Those are going to be the lines that are on the very, very bottom of the pole. So below the below the transformer, below the secondary lines, the neutral, that's going to be all the, the telecom stuff. You know, if you look here for, for service, is a customer around? Do they have a guy wire down? Again, primary, secondary, neutral. The 10, 20, 30 is, is the size of the pole. You can, if it's a 40, you can just put 40 in. You don't have to worry about the wire size because we don't have a clue. Wire length is going to be your best guess of how much wire they need. So if you look at the if you look at a pole that's down right in front of a house, how much wire is needed to bring that pole back up? And if the, if the service drop is impacted, how much wire is going to be needed for the service? Then you go down, do they, do they need any cross arms? You know, is it one or is it two or more? Most of the time you won't find any more than two. The size you don't need to worry about, they'll have all that type of information. Then you go through, do, do you need a service person to make repairs? Do you need a crew to make repair? So in this case, with everything that you saw down there, you need a crew to come in and make repairs because they have to fix the poles, they have to reset the spans. So that has to ha happen. And then can they get a truck in there? So if it's on the street, most times you're going to say, yes, they can. But the picture that you send will show that there's a tree in the middle of the road. So when we tell them, yes, the truck is accessible, right below that, you'll see where it says the trees. Do we need a tree trimmer? In this case, it would be yes. Do you need a manual crew? That's going to be the chainsaws. Or do you need a bucket truck that is going to be have to be brought in to get um, any type of trees leaning on wires or anything like that? Okay. And then when you do that, <clears throat> you put in the notes. So in the example you just saw, the transformer is damaged. 
you have a possible oil spill. I would also add team leader notified. You have a broken pole. So when you put the broken pole in, make sure that you have the category of the class and the size of the pole. Again, if you can't see the pole because it's, it's cracked and there's all wires in the way, go look at the next pole in line because 99% of the time they're going to be the same information. You guys hit on the street light damage. So they need, they know they need to bring a street light. They need to bring in the guy wire. The communication cables are down. The, that's more just information. There's nothing that they will do with any type of communications because the Duke Energy only is concerned with the primary, secondary neutrals and the transformers and all of that. Communications, that's going to be your cable companies. That's going to be, you know, your regular telephone company. They're the ones that are going to be concerned with that. You'd also see that the service drop to the customer is down. I would also put in a note here that the weather mast is intact or not intact. And that again, the tree crew is needed. And when you do that, they'll see up right above it. Do they need to have somebody come in with chainsaws or do they need a bucket truck? Any questions on how this whole form would be filled out? Perfect. Well, my question to you is. Well, you can't ask questions. When, when do you get those forms? How do you get those forms? When are they disseminated? <clears throat> the, all of the forms that you will receive will come from your team leader. And the team leader uh, gets them from the customer themselves. So we go to a muster yard where all the damage assessors will be. The customer will be there with all of the forms. Um, so they will be giving us these forms. They will also be giving us the addresses of, of places that um, need to be checked. Because One question on that. Yeah. Uh, Troy mentioned last week uh, something about they're going to an electronic app for the damage assessment forms now. They are. And there is, a, there, there is a whole training module above about that. But I'm not sure they have totally converted. So in this case, um, you know, if a storm came in tomorrow, I would right. tell you we're, we're using paper. Right. Okay. I just it was just a point of curiosity. Yep. Absolutely. But those all the forms will be given to you there. When you go, um, when you get the form from your team leader and tells you the service location that's down, you're going to be looking at that form and you're going to go, you may have to go physically backwards to trace where that's coming from. So if you see the primaries and the secondaries, you just fit, simply have your driver, follow the location. If that's the only house that's down or there's several other houses that are down, there's no damage on the street, there's no power lines that, that are down that you can see, you need to keep walking your way back or driving your way back until you find the location that has caused the outage. So that way, when you fill out this form, you can put down for, for the, the address, the, the street name, you will take pictures of you know, the, the first address, take pictures of the last address, and then you can say, like in this case, you know, 1071 Classic Road to 1060 Classic Road is down. And that way they know there's a whole class of houses and that when you come back and you put in your remarks, you can tell them that you have a primary site down on such and such a street 
you have lines down and they will know exactly from looking up their maps, the address that you just gave them where the lines are down, they'll be able to trace it back and they'll know that those of all those other houses are due to the main line being down. And I have had to physically walk a mile in a, in a let's just say a back area setting because the primary lines went through a set of woods and we had to go trace the line, what was going down. Um, we didn't see a line down to probably about three quarters of a mile, but we did see other damage. There were poles that were leaning. There were some cross arms that were broken. So all of that information was sent in. So they know when they came to restore service on this, they don't need just one pole. They need three, four, five, whatever, whatever number of poles that were down or, or leaning had to be replaced. So when they get to that, they can see, you know, there's a lot of work to do that, depending upon the number of houses is going to be where their priorities are. So if they have to replace five poles to bring up one house, they're probably going to want to replace five poles to bring up a group of houses. That's just the reality. Again, you would never tell a customer something like that, that, you know, there's other priorities in front of them. Just tell them, you know, you're here getting the information. You know, we're making it faster for the electric company to come and get your power turned back on. All right. <clears throat> we talked about it several, several times today. Safety. We don't want you to be a 911 call. Always use your best judgment to being safe. We're going to give you the proximity um, alerts that you wear in the brim of the hat that will tell you if there's any type of power going on. But you don't want to be walking around over the wires, trip on them, fall, get hurt. You know, like in, in this case, you'll see. There's one wire on the sidewalk. If you step over that one, that's okay. But if you look a little bit carefully, just maybe I'd say five or six feet above it, you have three lines that are down. I would never recommend do walking over three lines, walking in between three lines. You walk around them. You never want to touch them. I know it sounds like a broken record, but it has to be. I mean, when you're the, you're the people that are out there, you're the one that's doing the work, and we want to make sure that you are safe as possible doing this. So when you go out, <clears throat> and I know this slide was, was in the training module, but I wanted to make sure that everybody understands that you assume any wires that are on the ground are live, whether your proximity alert is going on or not, going off or not. Just assume they're live. Stay 10 feet away from them. You know, high voltages can arc across multi multiple feet under the right circumstances, especially if they're in water. So you just have to be on your best guard not playing with any type of wires. You don't touch them, don't step on them, nothing, okay? The PPE requirements. Now, most of you probably already have a lot of this stuff if you were working on the yards. So you'd have the hard hat, you'd have the safety boots, You'd have the reinforced um, steel toes. You'd have rain gear. You'd have a safety vest. The personal, personal voltage detector, you will always get from your team leader. Now, it says rubber gloves. Do you need rubber gloves? No. You're not going to be touching anything. If you go to a cold state like Massachusetts, New Hampshire, you want to wear rubber, regular gloves because it will be cold. 
you also want to make sure that you have some type of rubber boots. Now you can go to you know a lot of different stores and just get a pair of muck boots. Um, that will give you enough protection when you're walking around the streets and puddles and everything else. You never have to worry about ice cleats or thermal waders. I mean, we're just we're just not there. We're not working in Alaska. You know, most of the places we're going to go to, it's going to be Florida, which is going to be warm. South Carolina, North Carolina. I've gone to South Carolina in ice storms. It's been chilly, but a regu regular, you know, heavy jacket, gloves, and, you know, like a beanie hat or something like that. That That's all you really need. And then the other places we, we've gone to would be um, Texas. And that's not that cold either. Oh, and Louisiana. And Louisiana is usually warm. So if you get sent to a location, you know, pack what you want for to make sure that you stay warm, you stay dry. Because the last thing you want to do is have wet feet walking around all day long because it will be 100% miserable for you. Now, it says the rubber gloves have to be dielectric tested. Um, yeah, they should be, but you know, people aren't going to spend a lot of money to um, get those boots. So as long as you have completely rubber muck boots, you're in good shape. Okay. Any question on any of the damage assessment PPE requirements? Okay. Okay, wait. It's me again. Yes, sir. Um, as as I understand it, they recommend having binoculars or oculars, whatever you so you know could get your hands on. Now, you'd say, well, that's an expensive proposition, and maybe that's not in the cards, but it's not so much. You can actually get a pretty good pair for under fifteen dollars, or if you have a new good iPhone. You can take the picture of it and blow it up and might be able to get the information off of a pole or off of a transformer. Just saying, it's yep. probably not a bad <laughs> idea to have that in your repertoire. Also, one other thing, there's some questions in the chat box that, can you see them, Ron? Um, yep, let me take a look at them. <clears throat> All right, so Ricardo wants to know where the poles, where would the pole size be? When you look at the at the pole, it's probably about six feet off the ground. It's going the pole's going to have a bunch of information, but you're looking for the last set of numbers on the very bottom of all of the numbers there because it tells them everything that you know that we don't care about. It's going the first number is going to be class, and the second one is going to be the height. And then Ricardo wanted to know what is the distance it picks up for the hot wires. Um, we've covered that. It's about 10 feet. All right. This general picture of just what you need. You definitely need a cell phone. And make sure that you, when you bring a cell phone, you have some way to charge it. Now, you, you'll be able to charge it at night, whether you're at the hotel or you're in one of the sleeper trailers or whatever. But during the day, you need to be able to charge it. So if you have a USB connection in the driver's car, you can plug it in. Just make sure that it, it stays as charged as possible. Everybody should already have a hot hat. They should have safety glasses. If not, you can go to Lowe's, Home Depot, Pick them up for five, ten to ten dollars. Not a big deal. Everybody will have a safety vest from working on the yard. The voltage detector we will give you, so you don't have to worry about that. Hand protection. Again, you're not touching anything. The only hand protection you would really need is if we go into a colder state. You will get an ID saying that you are with Qualtech. 
and you can put that either on your vest or you can put it on your pants like that gentleman has it in the picture. You need some type of a light. Now you don't need this fancy light that he has. The only time you're going to need a light is if it's dark and it's gonna be at the beginning of everybody going out or you might be out a little bit later where it starts to get a little dark. We really don't want anybody out when it's dark because you can't see where you're walking. You, I mean, even with the light, you, we don't want you stepping on wires. So we try to get you in and out while it's still light or the, the worst would be twilight. So at least you can still see what you're doing. <clears throat> you can, I would get, you know, a small rechargeable flashlight. Again, USB um, is, is always good. All my lights that I use are USB lights. Um, it's very, very easy to charge in the car and, get, and keep them up there. Again, most of the time you will not need a light. Proper footwear, can't stress that enough. You want to make sure your feet don't get wet because you go to South Carolina where it's 30 degrees on an ice storm and you step in a puddle and you get your shoes soaked, it's not going to be a very fun day for you. You want, you're going to want to have some sunscreen and some insect spray. And the first aid kit is always good to have for the vehicle. The damage assessor or the or the driver, either one can can have the first aid kit. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just you know something, couple bandages, some in, antiseptic wipes, and you're good to go. All right. Any questions of what we've covered so far tonight? One question. Uh... On the vehicle we're riding around in, do we need to have a beacon? No, you do not need a beacon. Um, we would recommend to you to make sure that your flashes are on. So that way they, they can, number one, see, see the car and know that you're, you're in um, <clears throat> working for the power company. Now, a lot of people have their flashes on, but you will also be receiving, in most cases, a letter so if you have to go someplace past police, um, you can show them that the, show them a letter that you are working with the power company to get the power restored. Any other questions? Did we scare you guys? I don't know, Mike, they're not talking. If you have fun. Nah, you ain't scared. <laughs> All right, we, I mean, we wanted you to, to see this, you know, as much as you're going to see when you go out to do your first call. You're going to look at this and you're going to look, you, I'm think, guarantee you're going to think the same thing that I have. Oh my God, what did I get into? First I, I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, uh, out in the damage assessment, uh, are we strictly only going to be assigned to the overhead distribution? And uh, what I'm asking is, house and subdivisions and stuff. You know, uh, a lot of that's gone to underground. Correct, and, and and even though it's underground, it's part of the the distribution system. So if <laughs> if you get an address that's out and you're in a subdivision and there are no lines, you're gonna to have to go around the subdivision until you can find where that's going to some type of a substation. And at that point in time, you'll be able to walk back from the substation to find out what's going on with, with the physical service. And when I say walk, you can, you can be in the, in the vehicle driving you know, as, as you're in the vehicle, the damage assessor is the one 
responsible for looking all around. You don't want the driver looking around and say, oh, hey, oh, here it is. You know, if you, if you miss it, fine, but that's not his job. His job is to drive the vehicle, make sure that it's safe at all times. The damage assessor is the one that's looking where we're going. Any other questions? All right. Well, I hope this has been enlightening for you. If you have not done this before, um, it is a very fun and rewarding job. I enjoy being able to help the people that we go out. People, when you go to the and you and they're reporting on things that are down, they're inherently going to come out and talk to you, just because you have the vest on. <laughs> and you're the only person they could see with some type of authority. So they're going to come out and talk to you, you know, <laughs> be, be as kind to them as you can. I mean, everybody has lost their power before, so you can empathize with what they're doing. We know it's probably going to take days for it to come in. So we don't want to give the, the customer the wrong expectation saying, oh, yeah, we're here. You'll have your power back in a couple hours. You know, the easiest thing is we're working as hard as we can to get your power restored. That's why we're here. And, you know, a lot of times you're going to be that person's lifeline to give them some type of hope that their power is coming back on in a reasonable time. And then once, once the power does come back on, our job isn't over because in most cases, and I've gone through and done a lot of them, they'll give us houses to go back to and make sure that the power is on. So, I mean, we, we do that all the time. And, you know, as Mike has had said in the, the introduction, you know, I am a member of Homeland Security. When I go out in the field, I do have my identification and I do have my badge. So a lot of people can see that and know that, uh, you know, the, the government is somewhat doing their job to help them out. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's the easiest way to say that. But it gives them, you know, some, they say a lot of times, you know, thank you for helping us out. Thank you for getting our power turned on. I mean, God forbid, I've had people that want to give us fruit and candy and, you know, a lot of people will give you water, you know, can we give, give you anything? Yeah. I usually just say, no, thank you. I have, you know, everything I need in the car. But they will do that for you. Any other questions? All right. Again, check thank your, you. Put in your chat box. Yep, yeah, one. check your chat box. Yep. All right. So maybe this is more of a question for Mike. When are we at dis when we are dispatch? Will we be going straight to a yard at the storm or meeting up outside of the affected area? Whenever we go someplace, first step is always the yard. No ifs, ands, buts about it. When you get on the yard, um, somebody from RLI will be checking you in as you drive in um, so they know that you're on site. And then the next thing that you need to do is contact your team leader. And your team leader will give you all the rest of the information you need. Are we staying in a hotel? Are we staying in um, sleeper trailers? What time are we going to meet in the morning? Um, is there food available on the yard? You know, all the information that you're possibly going to know, you know, we'll be able to give you that information. And, and just, you know, while, while this point is up here, let me just, uh, and Mike can, can correct me if I'm, if I say something incorrect, but if you're going to be dispatched or think you're going to be dispatched, do not do anything as far as refueling your vehicle, nothing until you have physically 
dispatched by RLI. At that point in time, you can go fuel, fuel your vehicle, make sure that you get the proper receipt. It has to show the amount of gallons that were purchased, the, the, the purchase amount, you know, not, not some of these, you know, receipts, oh, well, it didn't print out correctly. And somebody from the store gives you a receipt saying, yeah, you spent $125 for gas. That's not gonna cut it. It's gotta be a valid receipt with the number of gallons you purchased and the physical amount. If you're traveling <clears throat> to a site, um, you, you'll get a stipend for food. Most of the time it's $30. No receipt can be higher than $25. And <clears throat> whenever you go out, I always recommend no drinking at any point in time until you get back home from being released. We don't want somebody, you know, drinking after three or four days doing damage assessment, getting in an accident, going home, you know, because they were a little happy. Wait till you get home. All right. And then I think that was just was the other one. Yep. All right. So overhead meets underground on the outside of the neighborhood. We already talked about that. All right, anything else? What's the vehicle requirements for the driver? Well, the vehicle requirements are to have a solidly running vehicle. We would prefer to have a four by four. Does not have to be a truck. Would be nice if it is. I mean, I physically drive a Ford F-250 pickup truck. Not everybody's going to have one of those. I used to drive a 150 pickup truck. You know, it's a little bit more reasonable. But if you have any type of a four-wheel drive car, you'll be fine. And more more often than not, I mean, you if it's a lot of rain in the area, you know, you're going to go through some mud and everything else. And you there are going to be times that you're going to need the four-wheel drive to get, to get out of stuff. Anything else? Well, right. not to not to disagree with you, but if you have a good roadworthy automobile and you're sensible, not going to be a problem. Um, for a long time, this goes back many years ago, all I had was a two-wheel drive truck. We never got stuck. Why was that? Because we use common sense. So they don't require that you have four-wheel drive. It's better. Always better, but not necessary. Um, there was a, a question earlier that and now it's down below the chat room view, and it goes something like this. The um, There was no requirement, and this may have changed. It may not be that way, but there was no requirement for the oil spill from a transformer to have a designated watch person. It was only if there's a live wire. Now, Ron, is that the case or has have they changed that rule with the oil spill? Once once the EPA is, is notified, they'll tell us whether they want someone to stand on site or not. Okay, all right. Uh, anybody else with any questions? There was one question here, will, will a satin car work? Yes, like Mike said, as long as it's roadworthy, it's not gonna be breaking down on you, you know, just, be very careful when you're driving and you should be absolutely fine. You know, like um, you said, you got common sense, but common sense isn't common anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're doing this, you need to have as much common sense as possible. And, you know, for the people that have done this before, you know, this is old hat for the people that haven't done this before. For the first one or two days of a deployment, bug the heck out of your team leader. You have any questions, you call. You know, you send him, send him or her the pictures. They'll tell you what to do. 
because when we all go through all of these, these different types of assessments, we want you to be the des best damage assessors that you can possibly be. Because if you do that, you do the job right, you're very careful, you're thorough, they're gonna be asking you to come back every single time. And that's gonna put a lot of money in your pocket. Yep. And, you know, I'm not gonna mention names, but I will tell you, on one of my deployments, there was a person that signed up as a damage assessor, didn't know exactly what he was doing. Um, he would call me, I would give him the information that he would need, um, but he didn't follow the rules and he had to be let go from the ad. Not something that we want to do. So if your team leader tells you to do something, it's not, and it doesn't sound, you know, normal. It's not because we're being jerks. It's because we want you to do the right thing, put in the correct information. If we tell you to sit, or, sit on your butt and, you know, stand on your head, whatever, we're telling you that for a reason. So make sure that you use us and abuse us because Mike does all the time. All right, any other questions? Hey, 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 I'm still part of this meeting here. <laughs> hey, by the way, Ricardo, what in the heck did you mean by a Satan car? That's what, a Saturn. What is Willis? A just Saturn? Yes, Saturn? Saturn? C-A-T-U-R-N? Thank you. Uh, so Dan. Thank you mean a sedan, yeah. So Dan. So Dan. 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 So Dan. Dan. Okay. Yeah, so so Dan. Right. There you now go. I got it. Yeah, oh, man, y'all tripping. Yeah, we all don't right. know nothing. We don't. Well, <laughs> we're not good. Maybe it's all good. It's understandable. Okay, Ricardo. All right. All so, right. so if you have no guys and have no other questions, you can always, always get a hold of Mike. If you have any questions, you can always call me. I have no problem taking calls from, from any of the damage assessors asking any information. And the people on my team um, know that I'm available for them. And, you know, we'll be available for, for anybody that comes in and works as part of the team. So you have a question and you didn't think of it tonight. You know, feel free to ask. Thank you. Nothing. Man. If there's nothing else, thank you for your time. We appreciate all the questions and answers that that you did for us. And I'm going to turn this back over to Mike. Thank you, Mr. Customer. Um, I don't have anything to add to the meeting. I will just say a couple things. Uh, this is going to. This has been recorded, so I will post that and send the link out in the next couple days. You can look at yourself on the whatever Zoom meeting. But it, more, more importantly, anything that you need to have done, please make it happen. If you have a question on the different videos or how you're going to do what you're going to do, let us know. Um, I'll answer all those questions. And you know that I'm probably um, more available than you might think. Just don't call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, which people have done because something's <laughs> bothering them. That's not that's not my job. Not yet. Let's anyway, see. what when we're doing when we're doing storm work, then that's all bets are off. Then then we have to be kind of vigilant. So uh, I'll I'll be available to you, but don't do that now. So on that note, um, when we're done here, close out the meeting. Make sure that you hang up. Make sure that you no longer part of it. That it's just an open corridor to. Hey, I didn't know you were on the beach. Uh, that's just an open I, corridor for the hackers. I don't tell you everything, in. you know, Mike. Boy, I'll tell you, you've got it going on. Yeah, he's All got right. the scenery in the background for sure. Yeah. <laughs> jealous. I want to be home. There you go. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. All right. Thank All you, right. everyone. Bye. Take care, Mike. Bye-bye. <clears throat>